thank you very kindly. I can't believe you're all still here. Don't you people have homes? <laughs> well, for our text this morning, we will talk about Proverbs 2012. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made both of them, or made them both. You know, the Bible doesn't speak of the parathyroid or the pituitary or anything like that. But we know God made those organs too because the scriptures tell us that without him, nothing was made that was made. But the Lord does not want you to be confused, <laughs> for sure, on the hearing ear and the seeing eye. And if you had to pick a couple of organs to uh, really drive home uh, the sovereignty and, and majesty uh, of our creator, uh, I would think these two would be as good as any. Why is it people have so much trouble in accepting this today? Many, many people, very intelligent people, uh, by and large, my experience, honest people, good workers, by human standards, uh, worldly standards, very, very fine people, and they have trouble. In fact, for many, it appears to, to be essentially impossible to believe that uh, there is a creator of the ear and a creator of the eye. I think the scriptures answer that for us because it uh, tells us that uh, he that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? Think about it. That's a frightening thought. If you do not have a creator, or if you do not have a savior, can you really afford to have a creator? I think we get the idea that we can go out there and uh, hit people over the head with a lot of scientific evidence that we can show them how wonderfully made that this or that part of the body is or how magnificent birds are or whatever, and I give such talks, and that by doing this we're somehow going to browbeat or intellectualize people into becoming Christians. And I think what we often do is we scare the daylights out of them. And that's good. Uh, I, I consider that the law. Have you thought of this, that, that when we talk about the marvelous handiwork of God, we're really teaching the law? Because it's frightening. People are not that stupid, you know. They, they understand that if there is a, uh, if, if an eye has been created by a creator, then that creator can see. And if an ear has been created by a creator, that creator can hear. And he can see very well and hear very well. See into our hearts and hear our inmost thoughts. And... Uh, so let me submit for your consideration that people can't afford to have a creator without a savior. Maybe we get the cart before the horse sometime. Well, let's start with the hearing ear. The Lord said he made it, so you know it's going to be good, don't you? It's a wonderful thing. We start with sound. Uh, the sound of the prophets has gone out everywhere, and we have heard it. The word of God was passed on largely by sound for many years, by the word, spoken word. We know that word comes empowered with the Holy Spirit, and that word created the heavens and earth. That's how powerful that word is, and that word can be heard by us with our own ears that the Lord has given us to hear, and yet those ears so often seem incapable of hearing without being energized. In fact, I would say virtually always incapable of hearing without being energized with the Holy Spirit. And, and what is sound when you think about it? As I speak up here, is there something traveling between me and you? <laughs> Does something leave here and go out to you? Actually, nothing ever really changes place very far. You see sound. Uh, think of this little bell in the upper right-hand corner here. The little bell rings at a certain frequency, or probably a combination of frequencies. And uh, what is it that travels from the bell to the ear? It's compressed air and rarefied air, or dense air and less dense air, just like air pressure. Pulses of air pressure. Now, the pulses do not actually, the, the molecules don't move. One molecule hits the next molecule. Think of billiard balls on a table lined up in a row, almost touching one another. If you hit the first ball, it hits the next, 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 next. And none of them move very far, but the last ball takes off. And that's the way the molecule, uh, the molecules of air work. It's all done with air pressure. Now, here's an interesting question. What kind of air pressure does it then take? I mean, if my voice is, is making little pulses of air pressure, knocking one molecule against the next, and finally knocking against your eardrum, what kind of pressure are we talking about? Well, uh, 
We are talking about an ear that is sensitive to a change in pressure of 1 times 10 to the minus 10th atmospheres. Now, what does that mean? An atmosphere is uh, basically the air pressure we have at sea level. So uh, it's 1 times 10 to the minus 10th of the atmosphere at sea level. That much of a change in pressure is sensed by the ear as sound. Now, we know that as we go up on a mountain, air pressure gets less, right? I have trouble breathing up there. And uh, if you go on top of Mount Evans in Colorado, 16,260 feet or so, you end up with about a half an atmosphere of pressure up there. It's quite noticeable. And of course, if we don't go quite as high, uh, there's less reduction in air pressure. What kind of changes is our ear able to hear? <laughs> This figure doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but if you compare it to altitude, pressure changes in altitude, it's comparable to changing altitude by one thirty thousandths of an inch. Now, I have a micrometer at home that measures in thousandths of an inch, and I couldn't find anything that you could see that was this thin. So I will exaggerate and get a much higher altitude for you here, a sheet of paper many times thicker than that 30 thousandths of an inch. I'll place that on the floor, and I'm going to step from the floor up onto the paper. <laughs> I'm not in the best physical shape. It'll take a while. <laughs> and uh, I am now stepping up to this higher altitude. You know, the air is thinner up here. No, the... <laughs> Think of it. That much difference is the kind of differences in pressure we're talking about. You know we're going to be seeing a pretty incredible piece of equipment. Well, here it is. Three basic parts to the ear. The part that's sort of done up in orange here is called the outer ear. And sound, as you know, comes into the outer ear through air, compressed and rarefied air. This sound hits the tympanic membrane, or the eardrum, and this pink part, or part that's shown in pink, is bone. So sound now switches over from being conducted through air to being conducted through bone. And then it reaches this next section, which uh, that's the middle ear we've just mentioned there. The next section is the inner ear, and in the inner ear, the sound is conducted through fluid. So we're going air, bone, fluid, in three steps. Let's look at each of these sections. We'll start with the outer ear. There we'll talk about the auricle, which is the name given to the whole part of the ear you can see, sometimes called the pinna. We'll talk about the external auditory canal. That's the hole that you hear through. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the uh, seruminous glands that make earwax. And I've been threatening Ken for, I don't tell you how long, that sooner or later I was going to give a lecture on earwax. <laughs> and this is it. Uh, the lecture on mucus is still in preparation, so... Uh, <clears throat> well, I was asked to make this lecture uh, educational as well as boring, so let's get right into it. <laughs> here you can see that our ear is uh, attached to our skull uh, here on the side, and there are three muscles, one above, one behind, one in front, and those muscles move the ears a little bit. Some folks can move the ears better than others. I never seem to have quite mastered the art, and, of course, some animals uh, are capable, you look at cats and what have you, of moving their ears about quite vigorously. And evolutionists, of course, have made a big deal of this. This shows that we really we used to take our ears and aim them all different directions. Uh, how do we explain these muscles of the ear? Uh, we're just beginning to understand how sensitive even the shape of the ear is to our perception of direction of sound and certain nuances of sound, even amplification of sound. But these uh, ear muscles are really part of the facial muscles that you see here on the face of this individual. And uh, most of these muscles, with just two exceptions, the one around the eye and the one around the mouth, the orbicularis uh, oris in the mouth and the orbicularis oculi in the eye, those two are really pretty essential for what we would call normal life. Uh, if you can't close your eyelids, you go blind. You need to distribute the water over the eye. So that'd be critical if those muscles didn't work. Uh, and if one didn't have the muscles around the mouth, 
uh, you would uh, not be able to suckle, first of all, as a child. Food, liquids would drool out of the mouth, and it would certainly be very difficult. All of the other muscles, including those associated with the ears, fall in the category of what I call nice but not necessary. You see, the Lord has given us one of those premium model bodies that have a lot of features you don't really need. Do you really need the wipers and the washers on the headlights of that Mercedes? You know, life goes on without it. I'll bet a lot of you are doing without it, aren't you? But we have a lot of really neat things. I mean, do we have to smile? We have special muscles for that that pull up the corner of the mouth. If you get sad, there are those that'll droop the corner. If you'd like to grimace, we have the grimace muscles. You want to wrinkle your forehead, you can do that. But life would go on without it. Our face is alive, even out to our ears. No animal has a face like that. My wife thinks our dog has all kinds of expressions. Oh, look at Kadar, isn't he embarrassed, you know? <clears throat> now, Darwin thought a lot about these facial muscles, and uh, he had speculation for just about everything imaginable. I think my most uh, interesting speculation for Charles Darwin was his speculation uh, with regard to the ear, which I'll get to in a bit, in addition to the muscles. Uh, the ear is shaped like a funnel, very complicated, and it does catch the sound in a very interesting way. And uh, back in Darwin's day, it had already been established by other scientists that the ear played an important part in uh, the directionality of sound and perceiving its direction uh, and in uh, amplifying it, uh, actually amplifying it a, a considerable amount, just like an ear trumpet does. But Darwin thought that the ear was simply a vestige uh, of our ancestors and that we don't really need an ear anymore, never mind that a lot of reptiles don't in fact have an ear on the outside. But he thought it was really a vestige of our primate ancestors. And in fact, he pointed to this little bump. You see the arrow uh, on your left here. And that's been called Darwin's tubercle. Because if you feel of your ear right there, a lot of you will see that right back here, right where we're pointing, there's a little bump. Do you have that? That's your primitive ancestry. That's called Darwin's tubercle. And that relates to our ancestors whose ears flopped over. And I'd like to show you one of those at this time. There it is. It's <laughs> That's my dog, Kadar. Do I have an hour to talk about my dog? No, stick with the talk. OK, well, go on with the talk. This is a wonderful dog. He's first place in the nation uh, in obedience uh, right now. So <laughs> anyway, I can't get him to do a thing, but uh, my wife can. Of course, she can get me to do things, too. But we better get out with the talk. <laughs> Now, as we come into the ear, this picture on the left is, is really exaggerated, that the opening uh, is much too large. Uh, this channel, the external auditory canal, is about an inch deep and about a third of an inch in diameter. Now, right there, the Lord knows what he's doing just right off the bat. We haven't even gotten into the interesting stuff yet, and we can see the wisdom of God. Our finger is larger than the opening into our ear. <laughs> Think about it. If we could get our finger into our ear, we'd punch out our eardrum before we reach the age of six months. So uh, Lord knows what size to make that opening. And indeed, the relative shape of that opening creates a resonance. If you blow across a soda bottle, you get the sound, you know, the resonance. It creates a resonance that's optimized for about 4,000 cycles per second, which is precisely where the range of human voice is. So starting right off in just nothing but a hole in the side of the head, we have some really amazing things going on here. And uh, it's kind of moist in there, and you can't get your finger in there, and uh, uh, the moistness would cause the uh, stratum corneum probably to soften up and fall off in cakes and everything, and the Lord knows about these things. And so we have some special glands in there, also, we really don't want bugs crawling in there either, do we? Uh, and we have special glands, they're called the ceruminous glands, that make earwax. They're sort of like sweat glands, only they make a really waxy substance. Uh, here's a picture of those glands in the microscope. They have ducts that come up to the surface. And that wax makes a coating aligning the internal part of the ear. It not only accumulates on the ear, it's produced only in the outer part, uh, but some of that wax and what have you even gets further in. And any debris that comes into the ear will tend to be trapped by that wax. Also, there are hairs that are aimed outwards inside that canal that would keep bugs from coming in. And the wax 
is a bit noxious for most bugs, so it does tend to keep most insects out of the ear. The problem is, if you are going to have all this wax produced in your ear, and then the cells in the epidermis are growing all the time and are constantly being exfoliated, how are you going to clear your ear out if you can't get your finger in there? Well, Lord has thought of this. This is not something that's escaped his attention. Let's just look into the external auditory canal to the eardrum. If you take a little particulate uh, that might have gotten in the ear, and let's say you set it right on the eardrum here, and that's been done experimentally, it can be observed that those particles will flow laterally to the edge of the auditory canal, and then will move in a spiral fashion outside of the auditory canal, carrying the wax and everything with it. It's like a people mover in an airport. You know how the, you stand on the belt? Usually the epidermis grows the surface of the skin from the bottom up, like that, right? Comes to the top, falls off. In the ear canal, it grows sideways. And that carries the wax out of the ear. And if it doesn't do that, your ear will become completely impacted and you can't hear. How do I know that? Because I have that problem. See, since the fall, all sorts of things have gone wrong. <laughs> haven't they? And one of the things that has gone wrong is that uh, sometimes our wax remover, automated wax remover, does not work properly. The cells do not move laterally as they should or at the speed they should, and so once a year I go in, I have to have somebody else get the earwax out of my ear. But think such incredible detailed uh, provident care that the Lord is even concerned about cleaning out your ears. Isn't this something else? Uh, Let's move into the middle ear now, and there we will see the tympanic membrane, the little bones of the ear, the muscles that are attached to those bones. As you know, you generally have to have muscles attached to bones, and the nerves. Uh, the middle ear is this area right here. Uh, we need this middle ear because we're going to a watery area over here. The nerves that sense the sound have to be under a fluid. They can't be out in the air. And so the sound has to go from the ear to the fluid. And have you ever tried talking to your friend underwater? Someone's underwater. I mean, my children used to be underwater about 90% of the time when we took them to the swimming pool. And you'd try to yell at them, get out of there, don't do this, you know. And this is a precious waste of the time of day trying to yell at a child underwater. <laughs> because you see, 99.9% .9 of all of the sound passing through the air when it hits the water there's what we call a difference in impedance there, an impedance mismatch. The traveling of sound through water is very different from air. When the, when the sound pressure and waves hit the water, 99.9% .9 of it reflects back at you. No wonder the kids don't pay any attention when they're underwater. You can't hear somebody speaking above the water. Do you see a problem here? <laughs> We're bringing sound through air into water for all practical purposes. You need a, an impedance matcher that will match up the impedance between the air and the water, and that's done with the bones. So uh, you get a little membrane like a speaker cone. Well, let's magnify that so we can see that. I call this magnifying the Lord here when I do this. We have a little speaker cone, and it is shaped like a speaker cone. It uh, is conical, and the air comes in and hits that and causes that to wiggle. And when that wiggles, it wiggles this little bone, which is the hammer, or the malleus as it's called, uh, this has a handle on it, as all good hammers do, that are attached to the eardrum. And when this wiggles, that causes this next bone to wiggle. Uh, if you have a hammer, you should have an anvil, shouldn't you, to hit, the, hit with. So that's called the anvil, uh, the incus. And there has to be a joint right here, and that's a little cartilaginous joint. That joint needs to be lubricated. I don't know when you've last checked the lubrication in that joint. But it does need, in fact, to be maintained and lubricated, and don't worry about it. It's all automatic. That has to be on a little axle. There are tendons you'll see in a moment, so it can wiggle. And when it wiggles, this end down here wiggles. And then that pushes on something that looks for all the world like a stirrup on a saddle. We call it the stapes, or stirrup. And uh, the little oval base of that stirrup is like a piston. Uh, it has to have a sealed and yet movable attachment to an oval hole and bone, and it goes in and out. And there is a substantial increase uh, in the efficiency going through this bone, such that you almost completely restore the impedance match uh, for the fluid. Uh, many, many times, uh, 
120 decibel increase in volume going through these bones over what you'd have if you, if you didn't have them here. Now reptiles just have a, a and, and birds just have a single bone going across here. Instead of this step of three, they just have one. And uh, that bone called the columella works quite well. In fact, there are birds that have better hearing than we do. So it doesn't have to be tricky like this, I guess, but it is in our case. Now let's look at a few interesting facts. We are able to hear sounds over a range of one million to one. Uh, that would be like standing close to a jet aircraft, or even worse, a rock band, uh, <laughs> and comparing that to the quietest sound you're, you're able to hear. And uh, what kind of movement of this tympanic membrane is necessary to do this? You've already learned it takes very little difference in pressure to be perceived as sound. How is that tympanic membrane moving? Well, at four kilohertz, which is approximately where you're hearing my voice right now, that eardrum responds to movements of one-tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. Now, I know you're impressed, but you're nowhere near as impressed as you ought to be when I tell you the next thing. This eardrum is living tissue. It has blood vessels in it. Lots of blood vessels. It has nerves. You know it's sensitive to pain. And going through these blood vessels are red blood cells. Six, seven microns in diameter. It's like uh, Rocky Mountains compared to baseballs. We have these, uh, when we're talking a tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom compared to a red blood cell. I mean, we have these immense red blood cells going through the blood vessels, just kicking that membrane all over the place while it is sensing movements due to changes in air pressure that are in the range uh, of as little as a tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. This takes some real noise filtration system. Anybody here into noise suppression and audio and what have you can really appreciate. We have something going on here that is just simply profound. Now, what about those little bones that are conducting these vibrations? The littlest one, the stapes, is the smallest bone in the body. It's three-tenths of an inch long. You could take all three of these ear bones and put several sets on top of a dime. Uh, and it weighs uh, one ten thousandths of an ounce. So these marvelous little bones are, are conducting the sound. This is the attachment of the handle of the, of the hammer uh, to the eardrum. And when the eardrum goes in and out, uh, here is the little hinge that it's swinging on, the axle. Uh, that makes the other end move up here like a teeter-totter. Uh, this is a lubricated uh, joint with cartilage in it, which then causes this to wiggle. Here, here is its hinge and axis here and here. And then that causes this long process on the anvil bone uh, to move. And on the tip of that is a little knob. And now if we turn and look the other direction, in, the, in that previous picture over here, this is where that little knob, again, fits into a lubricated joint uh, on this uh, incredibly tiny little uh, anvil-shaped bone. Now, these bones have muscles. What are the muscles doing? Here is the muscle called the stapedius. Comes up here, has a tendon. It attaches to the handle, where the handle is attached to the eardrum, the handle of the hammer. And over on the other side, the stapes, the stirrup, has the tiniest muscle in the body <laughs> with a little tendon attached to it. What are they doing? Well, first of all, I don't think we have very much voluntary control over these muscles. They're all sort of automated. The Lord didn't leave these kinds of things up to you. We're just not up to the task. At times when we have very, very loud volumes, we need to tune down the sensitivity of this system. And when the large volumes are perceived in the brain before you're really aware of it and can think a whole lot about it, these little muscles are already contracting to detune and dampen. Uh, sometimes we call this uh, muscle the tensor tympani and the stapedius, and it does just what the tympani player does in the symphony when he hits the drum and then puts his hand on to arrest the head. It dampens it. Now, it can't dampen so quickly you can't ruin your <laughs> ears with a pistol fired, say, two inches away from your ear. Uh, but it does uh, spare you from rock bands and other things. <clears throat> okay, let's look at the development of the ear. Uh, we will think of the development of the outer ear and middle ear, and for this we'll look at an uh, embryo, a 28-day human embryo. 
And uh, I could spend uh, an hour right here talking about this uh, vertebral column and the so-called tail here. Evolutionists really get excited about this tail. And uh, what's happening here is the nervous system is growing very quickly relative to the rest of the body. The heart's growing pretty fast, but the nervous system is growing quite quickly. And as a result, it, it folds the embryo into what we call a fetal flexure because of that rate of growth. And the vertebral column gets way out ahead of the body, at least ahead of the crown rump length here, from uh, here to here. And it sort of looks like a tail for a while. But then the body starts growing, and it catches up. In fact, it more than catches up on us. The end of our spinal cord is about right here uh, in the lower mid-back. So uh, it's a kind of a progressive process. And of course, it's not a tail, but that's another lecture. Let's look at the gill slits. How many of you have heard about gill slits, that the embryo have gills, and uh, that's supposed to reflect our aquatic ancestry? I bring it up because, well, first of all, I can tell you two facts as a human anatomist that you can bank on. Number one, we don't have gills as an embryo. And number two, we do not have slits. And that suggests, if you think about it, that we don't have gill slits. <laughs> These little folds have nothing to do with respiration, whatever. Their developmental fate has nothing to do with breathing, at least not directly by any means, certainly not with regard to lung and gas exchange. There are basically four of them that we can see. They say there are six that develop, but four are fairly easy to see here. And in a sense, they're sort of flexure folds, because notice the embryo is curving this way. So if I put my head down, I get wrinkles in the neck, uh, more so these days. And uh, in addition, there are little bars of cartilage under here and other structures that uh, help to influence this, uh, this wrinkling. By the way, the ear is going to develop right up in here. Uh, the otic placo to be a little vesicle or a little uh, hole that will develop in there that will form the outer ear. And uh, this is forming the eye here, the lens placode. Let's take a look at these arches. Uh, people love to call them the branchial uh, arches or the branchial apparatus. And the word branchial means gill. So they're kind of slipping one by you there when they call it branchial. A much better word used in the better anatomical texts are pharyngeal. That simply means it's in the area of the pharynx, which has nothing to do with gills. So we'll call them the pharyngeal arches, the pharyngeal apparatus. And there are several of these little folds here, as you can see on the side of the embryo. And the part that sticks out down here that you could see in the previous picture, they're the branchial or the pharyngeal, sorry, pharyngeal arches. And then in between, we call that the, the pharyngeal clefts. And then on the inside, there's what we call a pouch. So we have three different things to account for, the arches, the clefts, and the pouch. And in the arches, we have cartilage. Here's the arches, clefts, pouches. And then in those arches, we have muscle, cartilage, and nerve. And they go on to make various parts of the body. Let's just take a quick peek at that. If we run on ahead and look at the adult and see what these uh, little structures have been doing, or at least some of the things that relates to our lecture, uh, the first and second pharyngeal arches produce the uh, outer part of the ear that you can see. The tympanic membrane, that wonderful eardrum, is produced from the first pharyngeal pouch and the first pharyngeal cleft. And then the whole cavity that the tympanic membrane is in and the ossicles comes from the first pharyngeal cleft. And then our auditory canal comes from the pharyngeal cleft. And the eustachian tubes that balance the air on both sides of our eardrum come from the pharyngeal pouch. And by the way, you can see there are other organs here, the thyroids, the parathyroids, the cartilages of the voice box, uh, what have you, all come from this apparatus. None of them have anything to do with respiration. So forget about gills. Let the biology books talk about that sort of thing. It's silly. Uh, if you look at the cartilages of the uh, first pharyngeal arch, you'll notice that that cartilage makes a structure called Meckel's cartilage. And evolutionists have often gotten excited about that because they believe that it was the reptile jaw that gave rise to the little bones in our mammalian ear. And here you can see the cartilage of the jaw. And indeed, in the back here, uh, there are cartilages that will form the first two bones that we talked about, the hammer and the anvil, or the malleus and incus, are formed from the cartilages of that arch. 
actually, the cartilage that you see down here doesn't change normally in our body, I should say. Cartilage turns into bone or is replaced by bone. Our whole skeleton is produced in a cartilage form in an embryo. And uh, that's like you have in your ear. And then later on, the cartilage is broken down, becomes mineralized and dissolved, and bone takes its place. But there are two bones in the body that do not form from cartilage. One is our jaw bone down here, the lower jaw, the mandible, and the other is the vault of the skull. So this little cartilage, we're not sure what it's doing. Some think it, uh, Meckel's cartilage may be just giving a little shaping structure for the jaw, uh, but it forms directly into bone. Well, here's the evolutionary story, and uh, I'm sure you'll all be convinced because we have drawings showing the entire sequence from a primitive reptile down here, uh, unlike living reptiles today, which are up a little higher here, from a primitive reptile up through the different reptiles, the mammal-like reptiles, right up to mammals, what has happened? The reptile jaw has several bones, whereas our jaw just has really one bone on each side. And some of these bones of the reptile jaw are said by evolutionists to have migrated up into the ear, including the hinge part of the jaw, which must have made things difficult for a while for the poor reptile moved up into the ear and became the little bones of the ear that we've just discussed. And here's the whole sequence, which ought to worry you a little bit because they're lined up just perfectly. When you get to the top, you can see here the little bones of the ear that have formed and we're down to one bone in the jaw. Down here, we just have one bone in the ear and all these bones in the jaw. If you read the fine print in the article, however, you find that the first one at the bottom is a hypothetical organism. Uh, this one is a hypothetical organism. The middle ear structures, which are the most significant here that they're talking about, are also hypothetical. Well, what about the rest? They're not too bad, are they? Well, the author admits that these are not necessarily in true ancestor-descendant relationships, uh, and uh, that uh, most have been unknown and undescribed structures uh, that are reconstructed, and that the actual sizes are not uniform. So... Uh, <laughs> That doesn't give us much to look at, does it? Well, finally, let's go to the inner ear. The inner ear is where the ear really starts to get complicated. Up until now, we've just been kind of funning with you a little bit. Now things get really complicated. Uh, the inner ear is this part that's in blue here. And if we crank up the power, as you know, it's full of fluid. Uh, actually, two different kinds of fluid. One is sort of like cerebrospinal fluid that we have in our brain and what have you. Uh, the blue here is a bony material. We call it the bony labyrinth because it's very complex. It's like getting into a labyrinth. And uh, inside, rather loosely fitting, is a membranous material, sort of like balloon rubber or something. It's, it's a membranous stuff. And it forms little loosely fitting tubes inside of these bony tubes, uh, at the end of which there are these little balls, and then there's this big sac here. And from this, we have a tube that goes out into a structure that for all the world looks like a snail. Uh, in your head right now, this whole structure is about the size of a pea. So we're talking about something fairly small. And uh, remember the oval window we talked about where the, the, the piston of the stapes went in and out due to the sound pressure? That would be right here, the oval window. Now let's start out on the surface and look at this when it's still just covered with bone. Here's the oval window. The uh, stapes foot plate fits in there. It's all nice and tightly sealed so nothing can escape, and yet the seal allows a movement uh, of the piston, and that will create higher and lower pressure of the fluid inside this really complex structure. These structures over here are called the semicircular canals because they form three half circles. They're related to balance and movement. When we move our body, we can feel the direction we're moving. And I'll show you how in a bit. And uh, also, we have sensory structures in here that are sensitive to the position of our body, whether we're laying down, standing up, or whether we're being pulled by gravity. Uh, pressure that goes in here, if this is full of fluid and it's all bone, think of a soda bottle that's full of water. Can you blow air into it? You can't even get a cork into a soda bottle, it's full of water, right? Because you can't compress the water. 
If it's full of air, you can get a cork in because you can compress the air, but you can't get a cork in a bottle that's full of water. Well, that's the problem we have here. If, we're, if, we're, if, we're, if we are to have a piston that goes in and out, we have to have some way to relieve the pressure. So it turns out there's a second porthole down here. This is the oval window. This is the round window. And when you push in here, a little membrane covering the round window pushes out. It's as if the bottom of the soda bottle full of water had a, a rubber bottom. So now when you put the cork in, the rubber bottom just kind of rounds out, right? Then, then you could put the cork in if you had a rubber piece on the bottom of the bottle. And that's what we have here. Uh, let's just kind of saw into this a bit. Uh, this is a difficult dissection to do in the human body because even this bone is encased inside of other bone. Some of the hardest bone in the body, the Petrus bone, named after Peter. <laughs> Remember, uh, Peter was like a rock. Uh, Petros really means a rock. So if we cut away all that bone, we get to here. And now if we cut away this bone, we can see the hollow spaces where the membranous labyrinth fits inside here. The oval window's up here someplace. And when the pressure comes in, the, fluid, the pressure distributes evenly throughout. It goes into this snail shell around the corner, all the way up to here, where it gets into a second channel, comes all the way back down to here. And so the pressure in one causes this one to puff out a bit by following this incredible spiral course to the top and then back down another separate channel out. Let's see how well that looks in a kind of an illustration. The red would be the pressure pulses of pressure in fluid. Remember, fluid can conduct sound too, just like air. It just has a different impedance. And uh, it starts in the bottom down here, and it goes in and it goes round and round and round, all the way up to the top. And then when it gets to the top, it comes back through another chamber, all the way back and down. And notice the two chambers are separate in each turn. So the fluid in here has to get all the way up to the top to get in the chamber to come back out here. Uh, let's just magnify that. Here the fluid goes through this chamber uh, and uh, goes all the way up to the top of the spiral and then it comes back uh, through this chamber. Now why does it bother doing that? Because we have another chamber in between these two. This one is also filled with fluid but it's a different kind of fluid and the two do not, do not communicate. When the pressure is increasing in this fluid, it causes an expansion which causes this little plate to move down. And when it comes back, you have a comparable uh, effect on the bottom. And the net effect is this little triangular area is bouncing up and down. Got the picture? Uh, now when that hops up and down, we have a marvelous little mechanical device. Let's uh, take a look at that in a little higher power. This plate, I have things facing uh, just the opposite direction now. This little plate hops up and down. And when it does, there are some cells here that are in contact with a little uh, sort of a gelatinous, like a hard jello uh, cover. And this cover's on a hinge. Well, let's crank up the power a little bit here so you can see it. <laughs> Here's the cover. And here are these cells. The cells that are important for hearing have little hairs. They're not like hairs in your head. They're like cilia in your respiratory tract. And these little cilia tuck into this gelatinous structure called the tectorial membrane. And when this thing is pushed up and down, here's the action you get. Think of your fist as being what you see in green. Think of your hand as being the tectorial membrane. You put the tectorial membrane on top of that, and as it hops up and down, there's a sliding. See if I keep my hand arm hinged? As I go up and down, there is a sliding on top of these hair cells. That causes the hair cells to wiggle left and right. You have three outer hair cells, and you have one inner cell. Uh, there's about 16,000 of these cells in the ear, and uh, they each have thousands of these, or, or hundreds of these little hairs. And when the hairs wiggle, that's uh, what begins to produce the electrical signal we perceive as sound. Well, we'll go from the ridiculous to the sublime here now and look at one of these hair cells. Recent studies show that when these hair cells bend, they open ion channels that are on the top of these little uh, hairs. And these ion channels allow ions to come in, which changes the electrical charge inside of the cell. 
The problem is we have to open the gate to let the ions in and then close the gate at a rate all the way up to our highest level of hearing in terms of frequency, which is about 20,000 cycles per second. So something has to open thousands and thousands, millions of these little trap doors and close them again at the tips of all of these little hairs and has to do so at rates up to 20,000 times a second. Now they found that as the hairs tip, something is attached that pulls a trap door open and so help me, it's a spring. <laughs> it is a molecular spring. Now let's stop right here, go to the evolutionists and say, look, never mind, we'll, we'll, we'll give you Albert Einstein's brain, anything you want, you've got it, we'll just assume evolution's done it. Would you show us how to make this molecular spring? They can open and close at 20,000 times a second on a gated ion channel to let ions in to create electrical charges that go to the brain that are interpreted as sound that are understood as speech. It's too much for me. And then when we look in the scanning electron microscope, here are those little hairs. Uh, here are three rows of the outer hair cells. Remember, there was one row of the inner hair cells. And the tectorial membrane has been removed. You couldn't see it. You see, we've taken that membrane off, and now we're looking at the top. And let's just crank it up and see. This is glorious. Here are the little, these are the size of cilia, like in our respiratory tree, except they're non-movable cilia all except one. The one out on the tip here is movable. The rest are not movable. And they all bend when this membrane brushes their tips. Let's crank it up and look at them some more. They're like organ pipes. They're all stacked up here, just perfectly in four rows. And uh, there's one movable cilium up here at the tip, and the tips are all tucked into this gelatinous tectorial membrane, and when that shears, it bends these cilia. Oh my, you look at this and you just think, uh, what else can the Lord do? Well, the other thing the Lord can do is give us a sense of balance. If you've ever lost your sense of balance, you know that this is important. And we have these little canals and there's fluid in here. And the fluid and the canals are oriented in three different planes. Uh, one in this plane, one in this plane uh, that gives us our rotational one, and one in the lateral plane. And when we move our body like this, the fluid kind of gets left behind, you see. If you had, a, uh, if you had a, a tube with fluid in it like this and you move the tube like that, the fluid might run down the tube this way, right? Or if you had a ball in there and you go quickly this way, the ball might roll that way. And so it's the movement of the fluid inside these little canals that are just perfectly oriented in the three different axes of motion of our body. Uh, it's the movement of this fluid that tells us what our direction of rotation or movement is, if it's like this, or if it's like this, or like this. And how is that sensed? Well, there's a little bulge here called the ampulla, and in the ampulla we have hair cells. And on top of the hair cells we have something called a cupola, that's like the tectorial membrane. And when the fluid pushes the cupula left and right, that wiggles the hair cells, that goes to the brain, and it's interpreted as, hey, somebody's spinning you this way. Then we have other little structures called the macula and saccula. They basically are sensing gravity, and on the top of them are little stones called otoconia. The little stones are embedded in this jelly-like substance we've been talking about. The tectorial membrane, the cupula, now we're looking at these little uh, uh, maculae. And uh, these little stones have weight. And it's gravity pulling on these stones that moves the hair cells that tells you what direction gravity is pulling you in. So you know what's up and what's down. So the figure skater, when she spins, the cupula is being pushed to one side by the inertia of the fluid in there. And uh, when people bend over, the relative position due to the weight of these little stones <laughs> causes them to know what direction is down. You know, it's interesting, some of the other uh, creatures out there, like lobsters, you ever eat a lobster? Uh, their ears actually go through little holes in their exoskeleton. And this little uh, macula that has the uh, stones in it is down inside that hole. The problem is every time the lobster sheds its skin, you know, they do that every so often to grow, they uh, lose the little stones and they have no sense of balance until they put new stones into this hole again. Only it doesn't happen automatically for them. They have to actually go out and find bits of sand, stick it in holes in their ear. 
Now, who told them to do that? <laughs> they put the little bits of sand into the hole in their ear, and the gravity causes the sand to fall to the bottom of this chamber, and there are little sensory cells down there that say, OK, the stone hits. That means gravity is down this way. But you want to have some fun with a cheap experiment. Grow a crayfish or a lobster or shrimp in a tank, and when he sheds his skin, make sure there's no grit or anything in there. He isn't going to be able to find any stones. Then put some iron filings in. He'll put the iron filings in the ear. <laughs> and then bring a magnet out. And he'll go upside down. I have a few minutes here. I just can't help but tell you a little bit about the seeing eye. I, I don't know which is the most marvelous. The hearing ear or the seeing eye, I do know the Lord has made both of them. That's a wonderful piece of equipment you got there that you're peeping with right now. There's a clear glass window here called the cornea. It's as clear as crystal. It doesn't have any blood vessels in it. Over here it has blood vessels, but the Lord knew better than to put blood vessels in this area where you're looking through. And uh, that's really part of your skin. If you come down over the forehead, up under the eyelid, down across the eye, it's all really related to skin and the embryo, except this skin's as clear as crystal. Isn't it great? If you're going to have an eye to look, you have a window to look through. Wouldn't it be ridiculous to have a window and no eye to look through at a window in your skin? And then uh, you see the colored part of the eye. That's the diaphragm. That's like the diaphragm on a camera. It opens and closes. It's all automatic. You don't have to set the f-stops, you know, as you look around. It's all, all automatic. And then in the middle is the pupil. And when you look in here at the iris and the pupil, you're really looking at someone's brain. Because it's part of the brain. And, uh, you know, the Hebrews in the Old Testament knew about the pupil. They didn't call it the pupil. They called it the apple because it was the shape of the apple. And you've heard this expression, you're the apple of my eye. Isn't it great to be the apple of somebody's eye? Uh, I was the apple of my dad's eye. Well, that expression comes from the Bible, because you see the Lord in referring to Israel, and I believe ultimately in referring to all of us, since believers are children of Israel. He says that as they were in the desert wandering, he encircled him, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. That's where the expression comes from. It comes from God. And uh, King David, when he was being hounded and chased, prayed that the Lord would indeed keep him as the apple of his eye. He says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Now, why, did they call, uh, why, why do we have the expression, uh, keep me as the apple of your eye? The word keep here should perhaps best be uh, translated protect. We call a place we put something to protect it, a keep. And so what the Lord is really saying is that he will protect us as the apple of the eye. What does that mean? Well, if anything gets anywhere near your cornea to touch it, you'll blink. It's automatic. You don't have to think about it. It's a reflex. In fact, this reflex is so powerful, it's the last reflex to be lost at the time of death. Emergency medical technicians, if somebody is deeply comatose, they'll touch a little piece of cloth to the cornea right over the pupil, and if they don't blink, they're probably gone. The Lord wants you to understand that you're not merely the apple of his eye, as we use the expression, not knowing exactly what we mean, except we're very fond of something. But that he is protecting us, as we might understand, that we protect the apple of our eye. Reflexively. Reflexively to the death. Even the death of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, there is a... Uh, fellow by the name of Sir Duke Elder, who is, uh, I would say, Mr. Uh, I. He's written a multi-volume set of books that you can find in most uh, uh, medical school libraries. And Sir Stuart Duke Elder, an Englishman, uh, wrote a book in this series called The Eye on Evolution. And in the book, he says that uh, unless you're willing to get, engage in a lot of speculation and what have you, this has been a lot of thought that have been put on the subject of the origin of the eye, the vertebrate eye, with its inverted retina and everything. And he says that up to now, it's a problem that is as yet unsolved. This is in a book called The Eye and Evolution. I wouldn't have even brought this up, except he goes further than that. He says not only is it unsolved, but assuming you don't want to get involved with a lot of useless speculation, he says it seems little likelihood of, that we'll ever find a solution. So you got the picture? 
He says, we don't know anything about the origin of the eye, point one. Point two, he doesn't think we're ever going to know anything about the evolution of the eye. This is amazing. Did I forget to tell you that this book is 843 pages long? 843 pages that say we know nothing, we never will know nothing about the eye. Now, I'm pretty long-winded. I'd have gotten this across six, seven hundred pages. Easy. <laughs> But evolutionists are convinced that the, uh, not only was the eye not created, it occurred by chance, and so having occurred by chance is not the least bit surprising. It's a piece of junk, poorly made. Frank Zendler, who has a website, you can look this up for yourself. He's a retired professor like me, only he takes the evolutionary side of things, and he says that although the human eye would be a scandal if it were the result of divine deliberation, it would be a scandalous god who made such an eye, he says, there is a plausible evolutionary explanation of its absurd construction. You've heard of Richard Dawkins, wrote The Blind Watchmaker. That man knows more things that aren't true than perhaps anyone alive. <laughs> he says, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point towards the light with their wires leading backwards towards the brain. In other words, that the light-sensitive cells would face out towards the light, not the other direction. It sounds pretty good so far to me. He would laugh at any suggestion that the photocells might point away from the light. Wow, do they point away from the light? They really do. All mammals, all vertebrates, the retina is in upside down. Years ago, I used to work with a sheet film camera. It shows you how old I am. We had these big old press cameras that had the bellows, and you had to put the sheets of film in, load them in a holder. You did it in the dark, and it was quite easy to put the film in upside down. So the back of the film was towards the light rather than the front. And then you went out and you took all these pictures you never get again. You go into the dark and you develop them. <laughs> you end up with about 200 ukulele picks. I mean, that's about all you get out of it. Uh, the film's end upside down. Well, that does it right there. Obviously, an evolutionist wouldn't even think of studying a retina to try to understand why it might be advantageous to have the film end upside down. Uh, he can afford to just ignore it. And this leads to bad science. Because if you ignore evolution and just press right on ahead and say, if the Lord did it, I know it's got to be, there, ha there just has to be a reason. Oh, well, you find the reasons. I could do an hour on this alone. Let's just back up a bit. The eye develops as a little ball that comes off the brain. This is the brain in the embryo. We're not talking evolution now. A little bud comes out. It's hollow. The ball gets pushed in, sort of like an empty basketball here. And this will form the eyeball here. The iris diaphragm will be at this edge and that edge. Uh, this will be the retina, the inner layer. And this outer layer will be the choroid, which has a lot of pigment and blood vessels in, in our body. And in the middle is a space. And these two stick together. And God put them together so that they would stay together. But after the fall, just like marriages and everything else, they start coming apart. And we call that a detached retina. So we can see the beauty of God's creation. And right over the top of it, we see the effects of sin. It's beautiful. But something's gone wrong. It's like running your Rolls Royce out of oil. Marvelous automobile, but it's really damaged now. And what about the cornea? The cornea was really part of the skin out here. And what about the lens? It was a little bud that budded off the skin to make the lens. So the two parts are of completely different developmental sources, uh, the eye versus the lens and cornea. So there's the uh, developing retina. This is the developing lens. Let's move on and look at both of those. First, the retina. This is all the film in the camera right here. It's called the retina, and it's drawn very thick here so you can see it, but it's much thinner than a sheet of paper. And if we make a look at a piece of the retina, magnify an area like you see in the blue rim, uh, here's a picture under the microscope of the retina, and these are ganglion cells just like you'd see in the brain. The light comes in from above, and down at the bottom are the light-sensitive cells called photoreceptors, and sure enough, their photoreceptive ends are way down here. If you're the light, they're facing this way. And so the evolutionist says, forget about it. This is bad design. Don't even worry asking why this might be optimum. Now, your first clue that the evolutionists don't know exactly 
the proper answer here comes from the fact that there is a group of animals that have the retinas in right, according to evolutionary principles, with the cells facing to the front. And that's the cephalopods, like the octopus. And that's why, when you talk about somebody having particularly sharp vision, you say not that they're eagle-eyed, that would be an upside-down retina, you say they're octopus-eyed, right? <laughs> or did I get that wrong? No, you see, this is silly. Uh, an eagle can set up in a tree and can see a fish just under the surface of the water a mile away with an upside-down retina. And I have never heard that, uh, or anyone claim, that an octopus has vision that comes even close to that. Now, just behind these light-sensitive cells, we have a pigment layer. And this pigment layer is just full of blood vessels. Now, that begins to explain why uh, the retina is arranged as it is. And by the way, this retina is sensitive to a single photon of light. One photon. How much can you improve on that? <laughs> you say, well, if it was put together, right, and it was the right side around, maybe it would see sharper. Well, the resolution is limited by the optics, the lens and the cornea, not by the retina. The retina is better than the lens and cornea when it comes to resolution. So you can't improve on it by simply moving things around, but you can be sure there are reasons that it is the way it is. Let's look at that. Here's a drawing that makes things a little clearer. These are the light-sensitive cells, the rods and the cones. The cones see color. The, the others see kind of more black and white. And uh, the ends of these cells, the ends of the photoreceptors, called the outer segments, are the most metabolically active tissues in the body. They have to be replaced every seven days. You're burning them out. And when they're replaced, they're just shed right off the end of the cell, so you've got a bunch of trash here. What do you plan on doing with that trash? You have to have cells ready to eat it up and digest it, called macrophages. And you don't want those cells in the way of your vision. So by having it backwards, as the outer segments turn over, the cells that digest them are in this next layer out here. The other advantage is that when light comes down through the retina, it's very important that it, the last thing it does is fire this light-sensitive part of the photoreceptor. After that, the light must be trapped in the pigment. If it were to reflect off non-pigment things and come back through the retina, you'd burn out your retinas faster than seven days. And so that's a good reason to have this pigment right here. But the best reason of all the retina is upside down is about 95% of the blood coming to the retina is in this layer back here. These are not merely blood vessels. This is a lake of blood. 5% of the blood's on top of the retina. So you actually have to look through 5% of the blood to see. How would you like to look through 95% of the blood? It's a blood sandwich because of the metabolic activity here. So having it in there backwards is optimum. You can't improve on it. In fact, to give you an idea how great it is, several years ago, a neurophysiologist uh, published an article in Byte, and he was trying to simulate what the retina is actually doing, the signal processing going on in the retina. He says to simulate 10 milliseconds, that's 10 thousandths of a second, of the complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require the solution of about 500 simultaneous nonlinear differential equations 100 times and would take at least several minutes of processing time on a Cray supercomputer. This computer is so big and so expensive the Cray company doesn't own one of their own computers. Government buys them. He says, keeping in mind that there are 10 million or more such cells interacting with each other in complicated ways, it would take a minimum of 100 years of cray time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. What do you figure? Chance on that one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what about those blood vessels you're looking through? 5% are in front. That's a little worrisome, isn't it? As you look at me up here, you are looking through a skein of capillaries. When the ophthalmologist or the physician takes that scope and looks into your eye, you ever wonder what they see in there, old movies or whatever? <laughs> this is what he or she sees. They see these capillaries, and you are looking right through them. And you don't see them. And the reason you don't see them is because if the retina is like the sheet of paper, and it is, it's thinner than paper, the capillaries are like fingers right over the top of it. And they're, they're making a shadow on the retina. 
And you should see this, but you don't, because the brain has been taught the following little principle. If it doesn't move, ignore it. And so wherever the eye looks, these vessels just go along with it, and the shadow doesn't move on the retina. You say, but wait a minute, you can see this stand here. It's not moving. How come? Or how is that so? Well, the muscles of the eye cause the eyeball to tremor at a high frequency. And so your visual field is moving on your retina all the time, and that's why you can see it. If the muscles of your eyeball were to become paralyzed, you couldn't see anything unless it moved. And this happens to some people, so we, we know that this, this is true. But the movement of the eyeball doesn't affect the capillaries because they move with the eyeball. Does that make sense? So you don't see your own blood capillaries. Now, you could see your own blood capillaries if you could make the shadow move. That brings up another cheap experiment. One of these days, I have to do a book on cheap experiments. The next picture I'm going to show you is, by general agreement, the most interesting of all the pictures that I show. Each of you are going to... <laughs> Each of you are going to see your own retinal blood vessels by making a little tiny hole and looking through it. And you, I, don't do this, please. I see people out there saying, is this it? No. It must be the littlest hole you can make with your finger and still see through it. You will close the other eye, look through the little hole. Now, this is the next principle. You must move the hole left and right, not front and back left and right, and you must do so at a fast speed, like da 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 left and right. Do that while looking at the white screen up there, and you will see little grayish silver lines start to appear. These are your own retinal blood vessels. Each of you will see your own retinal blood vessels up here uh, on the screen. Those that don't see them, what can I say? Blind as a bat. <laughs> How many can see the retinal blood vessels on the screen? Isn't this great? Cheap experiment. You can do it with a pen light. Uh, you can just walk up to a white wall. Uh, and these are the muscles that move the eye, by the way. We have a muscle on the top, a muscle on the bottom, a muscle towards the nose, and a muscle away from the nose. When this muscle contracts, your eyeball looks up. When this one contracts, your eyeball looks down. This one contracts, the eyeball looks this way towards the nose, this one away. Got the picture? That's easy. But there's six muscles, not four. There's one on the top that doesn't quite fit in. It has to run front to back inside the orbit, has to send its tendon through, so help me, a pulley. It's a gorgeous little pulley. I've seen it many times. You have to be careful. You just touch it. It breaks when you're dissecting the body. And the tendon goes through there, and it attaches to the eye. And when that muscle contracts, the eyeball rotates this way. And there's a muscle on the bottom. When that contracts, the eyeball rotates the other way. So our eyeballs do this. Isn't this great? <laughs> as well as up and down and left. You're probably asking. Why does the Lord give us eyeballs that do this? Is this so junior high boys can gross out girls in the classroom? <laughs> no, unlike the muscles that move your eye up and down and left and right, you don't have control over these muscles to rotate. The Lord did not want you grossing out the girls in the classroom. What they're for is that he knows you'll be turning your head from side to side like this, possibly when you're walking. You know, your head does a little bit of weaving back and forth. And if your field of view is rotating, you'll get sick. Lord knows that. So it's all under uh, muscular control so that as you tip your head, the eyeballs rotate to stay right side up. Now, here's a cheap experiment. When we're all done here, get together with somebody at the table, look deeply into their eyes. We've had some really nice relationships grow out of this. <laughs> look into their eyes, see a little spot on the iris diaphragm, then have them tip their head, and you'll see their eyes are rotating, staying right side up. Now, don't try standing on your head. The eyes cannot do a 180. The Lord says, you have no business going from shoulder to shoulder. That's it. Okay, well, uh, there's so many wonderful things we can say about the eye. There's only one spot in the eye right here where we see things clearly. The light comes in, and just in this spot can we see things sharply. Everywhere else, it's not quite so sharp. If you look at me, I'm in focus, but everything else is out of focus. Isn't that true? We call this the phobia centralis, or the macula. And I've heard people say, well, that shows there's no creator. I mean, if there was a creator that knew what he was doing, he'd have the whole retina sharp. When you looked, everything would be in focus. Think about it. You pick up the Wall Street Journal or whatever it is you read these days, and if every single letter on both pages were all equally sharp at once, and all of them for all practical purpose saying, pick me, pick me to read, <laughs> you couldn't concentrate. 
We're too limited. As I look out in the audience, I can only see one of you at a time. If I look at the whole crowd, I see you all, but you're blurred. But I can see each of you individually. And the Lord knows we can only deal with people personally on an individual basis. He doesn't have a phobia. He can see you all at once. He can see you wherever you're at at any time, in the mountains or in the bottom of the ocean or wherever. But we're limited. And we have a limited area of sharpness. And God wants us to, yes, deal with people at large, but focus on people individually. And that's the way we see. Well, my favorite part of the eye is the lens. Here it is. The lens is rubbery. Uh, it's beautifully clear like crystal, only it's flexible. And there are cells that grow on the surface of the lens. And as they grow, they're like those cells in the canal of the ear. They slide along the surface all the way over to the equator. And at the equator, they turn into the lens. And when they do this, a little tiny dot, oh, it would be one of these cells, it starts elongating like pulling an antenna out of a car. <laughs> one end goes way up to the center of the lens, and the other end goes all the way back here to the center of the lens like a big bow. And so each of these little box-like cells, when it turns into the eye, having passed across the front, becomes elongated to make a long prism, and these are flexible like rubber. And so the lens can focus not like a camera lens by going forward and backward. It focuses by changing the actual refraction of the lens, changing its shape. It's much faster. Hey, and it's, auto, it's all automatic. The Lord could have said, I don't know how much more I can do for you. I've given you a wonderful eye. I'll give you a focusing mechanism. It'll be just like binoculars. We'll put a little roller on the top of your nose, and everywhere you look, you just focus. It'll be great. <laughs> you wouldn't get anything else done. But it's all automatic, and it's held in there with strings. <laughs> Little tubules that are hollow. I thought that was a nice touch, a hollow tube. Just little fine things that are attached. And when they pull, they flatten the lens so you can see at a distance. And when they relax, they come up close so you can see up close. Uh, let's just look at that lens in the microscope. Here are those little cells I was telling you about. They're like boxes. And at the edge, they turn into the lens. And then they become elongated. That's where you see these long lines. The nuclei actually die. The cell is dead inside the lens, and these dead cells are with you for the rest of your life. And since the fall, they cease to be rubbery later on. They get hard, and your lens doesn't focus anymore. That's not the way the Lord planned it and designed it. That's the way it is now. And if we take the scanning electron microscope and magnify the Lord again, that's the way these cells look inside. They look like boards in a lumber yard. They're perfectly stacked. And the reason they keep so each one of those boards would be a single cell that has lost its nucleus. It's full of a protein called crystalline. It's the most protein-rich cell in the body. It's as clear as glass. And if you crank up the power on that, they're locked together by thousands and thousands of ball and socket interlocks. What sort of God do we have? When he says he can do something, just bet on it. He can do anything he wants to do. If I'm ever privileged to walk the decks of Noah's Ark, that'll be the second best evidence I have for Noah's Ark. The best evidence is the Word of God, pure and simple. Now, you look at the simple organisms on Earth. Uh, they have lenses, too. The trilobites are supposed to be among the first to have evolved. They have compound eyes like insects. They have a lens, but the lens of the trilobite, or at least some of them, is a hard crystalline substance, just like glass in the lenses of your glasses. These uh, glass lenses are made of calcite, and the orientation of the prisms in the calcite is perpendicular to the surface. Uh, here is one of these uh, trilobites. You can see the eye on either side. We crank up the power on it. Here are the individual lenses. Because these lenses are mineral, a calcite, you can actually find fossils of trilobites. The lenses are probably in the same shape they were when the trilobite was alive, because it's a mineral. And they can remove the individual trilobite lenses from this particular species and look through it in the microscope. And they find out it has optical properties that keep it in focus without having to change shape from about a millimeter to infinity. That's the thickness of a dime out to infinity. And this is a wonderfully corrected lens. In fact, it took man a long time using principles of optics and physics to ever come up with a lens as good as this lens. How do we know that? Because the first really superb lenses were made by Descartes and Huygens doing advanced mathematical calculations. They knew it took two different kinds of glass. 
and you had to change the interface. This is called the doublet to get a highly corrected lens. The lens of Descartes just happens to be the lens found in this trilobite. And the lens of hydrogens is found in this trilobite. What sort of a crater do we have? And finally, let's just look at the eyelids. This is a good place to close. Huh? <laughs> we, have, we have window washers. Naturally, the Lord gave us window washers. You have to keep the cornea wet. You couldn't even see if the cornea wasn't wet because that's really the optical surface is the water, not the cornea. And the water comes from the outer edge of the eyes across the eye. And over here, there's a little hole, look close in the mirror, on each eyelid near the nose, called the puncta. There are muscles in there that suck the water off the eye. So it's constantly flowing. The washer fluid is optimized to be antibactericidal and just perfect for the eye. And have you been topping up the fluid lately? <laughs> See, it's all automatic, don't worry about it. And then the lids have a little cartilage, it's, it's, it's a little stiff plate that's inside the lid, and then there are muscles attached to that, and the muscles can then raise and lower the lid like this, so you can blink at people, see? Uh, if I use those muscles, and they're skeletal muscles, right, because you, you have voluntary control, don't you? You can open your eyelids, so those are skeletal muscles, and if you use that muscle to hold the eyelid open, and you look, and you look, and you look, and you look, do you see a problem here? You're going to get fatigued, and when you get fatigued, that eyelid's going to droop. The Lord knows about this. So he gives you a second muscle called the muscle of Mueller. I wish I had discovered it. could have been the muscle of Menton. <laughs> here is the second muscle right here. Can you see it up there? That's smooth muscle, not skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle has the advantage. It's not under voluntary control. And it can just sit and contract all day long and not get tired. That's the kind we have in our stomach, intestinal tract, what have you. And so we have smooth muscle to hold the lid up on the long haul, and then attached to that in tandem, we have skeletal muscle so we can blink at people. That's the kind of detail the Lord has in mind. Well, we talked about those tear glands, and here they are. They uh, produce the water that flows across the eye. There's a lipid barrier at the eyelid to keep the water from coming over onto the cheek. The excess water goes into the little pumps. The pumps pump it down into the nose. And into the nose, it's released, and that's why we get the sniffles when we cry. But if the water builds up too greatly, it breaks over the dam and goes down the cheeks as tears. And that's what the Lord has come to solve. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. <laughs>